replace the gym leaders and Elite Four of Pokemon Crystal with their counterparts of Gen 1 Kanto, and now it's really hard. Our goal today is to beat the game, and replacing the first gym leader Faulkner is none other than Brock. And in an insane show of dominance, Chikorita destroys his Geodude in a single shot with Razor Leaf, and does the same to his level 14. Onyx. So, look, that's the first badge down. I know I said this would be a challenge, and trust me, it is going to be. The champion fight in this game is blue, with a level 65 Charizard. That is 15 levels higher than Gen 2 Lance's ace. So things are going to ramp up like crazy, even for Misty in this second gym. But before we make it to Misty, I decided it was time to do some team building. You know, not even a cracked Chikorita is going to be able to make it through to the end of this game. So I caught a Growlithe on Route 36 and decided to train it through Sprout Tower. I also grabbed the Miracle Seed for Chikorita and evolve it into Bayleaf while running through Union Cave. From here, we arrive at Misty, who explains to us how upset she is to be stuck in Azalea Town with all these bugs and it's at this point I think we should impose some higher stakes. And I'm not just talking these rules here. No, here is my wager. Ladies and gentlemen, for every trader I lose to, I will give away either a copy of Scarlet and Violet or this ROM hack to one of you subscribers. All you have to do is obviously subscribe and watch to the end to find out how to claim. Now with that said, you're not going to be getting a copy from Misty as Bayleaf is able to do some serious cooking this fight. Now Staryu goes down no problem, and while Starmie isn't free, it's kind of inevitable that we're going to win this. It starts recovering, and it's able to heal more damage than I can lay out. Now from here, it's Bubble Beam takes me into orange while I have it to minuscule health, and actually fearing a loss here, Razor Leaf is able to do its thing. We're able to land that one and eight crit to take it down and secure badge number two. So no free copy for you yet, but again, keep watching. I promise you, um, things get a lot more difficult. Now from here, our rival, not blue, challenges us to a fight, but with the added experience of the higher level gym leaders, he's no match for the power of our Bayleaf. We then make it to Goldenrod City, where it's time to do some more team building. Now the first thing I do is I head all the way back to Route 32 to catch a level 7 Bellsprout, and then I trade it with the NPC in Violet to get an Onyx. Now I don't have access to trades on our emulator, so this isn't for the full playthrough, but I get a ground Pokemon so that we can hard counter Lieutenant Surge's Raichu. As for a step towards the bigger part of the plan, I then catch a male Nidoran in National Park, which I quickly evolve into Nidorino. Not able to learn Dig, we give it Mudslap along with teaching the whole squad headbutt, and it's now time for Lieutenant Surge taking the place of Whitney. Nidorino starts with some great luck taking out Voltorb and only losing 20 HP. Surge's Pikachu is up next, and at only level 18, it's also no match for us. Raichu, however, isn't going to be so easy, as it's Thunderbolt one-shots Nidorino. From here, though, with immunity to Electric, all Raichu can do is Quick Attack as we hit Screech and, oh, no, it has started double teaming. All right, well, down goes Rocky, but Raichu is sitting at a minus six defense, so all we have to do is land a shot. Unfortunately for us, that's the same for Raichu, as it's able to take Growlithe out in one shot as well. Fortunately for us, Bayleaf, okay, thought its time was over? Absolutely not. The goat of this run so far resists Electric, is able to eat a Thunderbolt sandwich, spit out the bones, and land a merciless headbutt to finish off this fight. Badge number three, secured. Also, may I add, I, I just love Surge's dialogue here. He's like, I, yeah, I gotta make you because of the code, but I will not cry. I don't know, just it feels fitting. So from here, we have a lot to do. And the first thing is actually going to be evolving Growlithe. So now that Sudowoodo has been cleared, we have easy access back to the early towns of the game. And since we've reached Goldenrod, we have access to Schoolboy Alan. So Alan's Schoolboy is located on Route 36, and he's the dude that actually gives you a Firestone. Gen 2 has very limited access to good Pokemon, and that's made even worse because getting stones was always so inconsistent. But there's a very neat exploit in this game, and we're finally going to give it a shot. So basically, you get Alan's number and make sure that you have no one else's. From here, you head back to New Barktown, and talk to your mom to continually reset and turn back on daylight savings time. Basically, every time you do this, there's a pretty good chance that it's going to result in him calling you. Now, there's a few different dialogue you can get, and if you get the wrong one, you just reset. Fortunately for us, it's only our second time that we get the right thing, where he says he has something nice for us. So we head all the way back to Route 36, and he gives us a Firestone. And it's at this point, I decide to actually just go for it and evolve Growlithe. This is a questionable pick, as we could wait to level 36 to get Flame Wheel. 
Growlithe does not learn Flamethrower. Arcanine doesn't learn anything. So Flame Wheel is a decent move, but 36 is going to basically be end game. And I'm thinking it's just not worth it. So instead of holding over Flame Wheel on a terrible Growlithe, I just decide to crank our base stats up to 550 and go with the Arcanine. From here, we fight a rival in the Burnt Tower, take out the Kimono Girls to give us Surf, and now it's time to take on the fourth gym leader, Erica. So she leads a 29 victory bell, and yeah, okay, Ember, Ember doesn't even do half. From here, she gets a nice stun spore off, but fortunately her acid doesn't even do 20 damage. And she goes for a hyper potion as Arcanine lays out Ember after Ember to take it down. From here, we manage to get one more off on Vileplume before it locks itself into a Petal Dance. And at this point, I'm thinking, great, it's locked into a grass move, we can just eat that, we're not at risk of poison attacks. Unfortunately, I land a crit headbutt flinch to unlock itself from Petal Dance, and now it doesn't even get the confirmation. Fusion. It then lands asleep, and knowing that it knows the move Acid, I swap into Nidorino to take the incoming damage, but it actually pedal dances, which is also fine. From here, Nidorino lands two headbutts to take it down. Next, Nidorino goes to sleep by Tangela, but manages to wake up and land a mud slap before going down. We swap to Bayleaf, who is asleep for like eight turns, but does manage to wake up and finish the fight for us. Badge number four down, and as you can see, the difficulty is already starting to spike. Now from here, once again, there is a lot more that we can do. We had to all the vine to get the good rod, and then wait till night to catch a level 20 Staryu. Now despite the fact that this is not going to have a psychic move for the entire run, I've always been a big fan of Starmie, and I wanted to run it. The big thing though is we now have Surf, which is going to allow us to get access to a very niche area, and that is the Ruins of Alf. So once you have Surf, you can head down to this otherwise inaccessible area and use Flash at the wall in this room to open up a secret chamber. Now there's like heal herbs and a gold berry, but the reason that we came here is for a Moonstone. At this point, Nidorino learns nothing else good through level up, so we just decide to go for the Evo into Nidoking. Now next up, we are using Surf again. We head east of Akrotique to find Fisher Tully. This is the dude with the quillfish, and this guy likes school boy Alan is going to give us a free stone. So we perform the exact same thing we did, heading back to New Barktown, manipulating RNG, and eventually he gives us a water stone. So boom, water stone in, Staryu doesn't learn anything else good, we go for the instant evolve on Starmie. And I gotta say, like even at this point, I'm feeling great about this team. One thing I wanted to do with this run is kind of divert from the standard Gen 2 team, and I feel like we're doing a really good job of that so far. Now it's at this point, I also teach Nidoking Thunder and and Ice Punch, and we give Arcanine Dig. And since we're already over here in Mahogany Town, and our level is severely hurting for the next gym leader, I decide to just head north, take on the Red Gyarados, and talk to Lance. The Rocket Hido, one way or another, is just always easy. It's super low level, but it is still gonna help to get our team up at least a little bit. And really, through here, nothing of note happens. It's just a bit of experience. Speaking of levels, we could actually, at this point, take on Price, but unlike in Gen 2, he is actually set to the seventh gym leader of gen one who is blaine who has a level 47 arcanine so yeah we decide to head west to get some more training in first now the plan is to head to chuck's replacer koga then Jasmine's replacer, Sabrina, and then finally we'll do Blaine. But before that, guys, I'm sorry. I have one more detour to make. Alakazam is a scary Pokemon. It's not quite as scary as Gen 1 Pokemon, but it's still very scary. Sabrina, as a whole, is looking real scary. So with her in mind, I actually take another detour to pick up Eevee from Bill in Goldenrod, and then I trade my red scale with Mr. Pokemon for an EXP share. This isn't gonna be the only scary Alakazam for this run, so I figure getting the dark type Pokemon Embryon will be super useful, both as a hard wall to Sabrina and Blue's Alakazam. So after a long grind session through the mid game, we finally make it to Koga, who seems to be a little confused on his identity, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So the difficulty spike is starting now, as he leads with a level 37 coughing, outleveling our Eevee by 8. Now, I lead with some super cheeser strats on Eevee to lower its accuracy and then swap Middle King, since it cannot get toxic, which is Koga's main strategy. Up next is a level 43 Weezing, which does no self destruct. Uh, it's at this point my biggest fear is just missing out on that juicy 
XP. So I run some back and forth weird strats between Eevee and Nidoking, and he actually does go for it on Eevee, who dies, but Nidoking gets all that spicy experience. Muck is up next, and it's going to be an RNG fest, so I just elect for mud slaps while he goes for the minimize. Fortunately for us, though, Nidoking is able to land some nice flinch headbutts to finish off Muck. From here, I go Arcanine, followed by Starmie, who takes a painful self-destruct to the face. And that's enough to secure us the win despite having a 14 level disadvantage. And if you think that's bad, I should mention that disadvantage is only going to grow through the entire run. Now with Gym 5 in her pocket, I get Fly and head back to Goldenrod to pick up the bike and do some serious friendship grinding. Basically every 500 steps you take increases Eevee's friendship. So you just go up and down a lot in speed up mode and eventually it gets to 220. And so we strategically make this happen as it's on level 29 because if you level Eevee up into 30 it will learn bite evolve into Umbreon and then learn confuse red overall Umbreon is going to be much more of a defensive Pokemon with insane bolt counters to psychics but it's you know bite is nice too and speaking of psychics those are up next we've got a team of 27s through to 30s and we are going up against another team ranging from 37 to 43 how might we possibly deal with this let me show you. So we lead Umbreon, who hardwalls Kadabra's moveset of Psychic, Recover, Future Sight, and Disable. Despite this, it decides to spam Recover until we sneak in a crit to take it down. Venomoth comes out next, and knowing Leech Life, I'm a little wary of this, so I swap into Arcanine, who is able to easily take it down, but sustains massive injuries. Since Mr. Mime knows Double Slap, I decide to swap into Bayleaf to set up Reflect and get great chip damage. From here, my Reflect fades as Umbreon comes out, but so does Mr. Mime's, and Umbreon Umbreon is so tanky here, it, it doesn't even matter. Just look at that bulk. Now last out is her 43 Alakazam, who under almost every circumstance should be an easy sweep for Sabrina. But since it only knows psychic attacking moves, it can't do anything. Umbreon is the only dark Pokemon you can get throughout Johto, and it is just a free counter to Alakazam. Now it does no recover, so this is a little annoying, but we do have Confuse Ray, so all we have to do is just wait for a good string of rolls and a bit of patience and we secure badge number six. Now I really thought Sabrina was gonna be the worst of our problems, but as it turns out, since we had already dealt with the rockets, there's basically no XP to be had from Sabrina to Blaine. Uh, so we're going to be taking this man on, complete with a level 47 Arcanine with a team of low level 30s and high 20s. Worst though is Blaine's team, despite having mostly fire moves, does have some hard hitting moves like takedown on Arcanine. So unlike normally, Blaine is actually looking quite intimidating. Now to add some additional coverage to the team, I opt to teach Nidoking King Surf and head in with him leading. Blaine leads with a level 42 Growlithe, which is actually not that strong since Growlithe has bad stats, so we're actually able to outspeed it and take it down in two before it can even damage us. Next up is Ponyta, who outspeeds us, but is only able to get us into orange before we take it out too. Now Rapidash is up next, and it's at this point that you guys get to bear witness to the issues of doing ROM hacks. This is just a very simple mistake of putting in the number five instead of four, but Craig, my guy who does mods, well, he put in the number five instead of four, and so this Rapidash is actually level 52. <laughs> rather than 42. <laughs> now, I'm not one to back down from a challenge, but this is looking nearly impossible. So to make this at least a little fair, I opt to just allow myself to use two heals. That's just to tip the odds back into relative fairness, I think. And after dodging a takedown, Starmie is able to finish Arcanine off with the Surf. Uh, I understand some of you may feel like that's cheating, but considering that Rapidash had an extra 10 levels over already being like 12 levels higher than us, I don't know, man, that feels pretty fair to me. Anyway, Blade hands us a badge number seven along with Icy Wind, who we teach to Starmie. The next up are the Rockets again, and this provides us with a pretty good opportunity to get some levels. Overall, like Arrival, the final Rocket bosses are here. They are not much challenge at all after that last fight. So there's not really much worth mentioning here, apart from the fact that we get enough money to buy Fire Blast from the casino and teach to Arcanine. From here, it's a relatively straight journey through Ice Cave to Blackthorn, where 
our final badge awaits us. This final team has a legit 50, which we will obviously not be using items for, but overall, with our team having some nice moves to combo, I'm actually feeling pretty good about this one. We pull up to the gym with none other than the legend Giovanni waiting for us, who explains that he has been called back. We lead Meganium and destroy his level 45 Rhydon. Up next is Nidal Queen, who exchanges Body Slam Paralysis with me before I swap to Starmie, who is able to take it out in one shot. Up next is Rhydon, his Ace, who goes down to a single Surf from a Pokemon 15 levels lower than it. From here, Doug Trio is able to land a Magnitude 7, but also goes down to Surf. And not even the King of Needles is he able to stand up to us as we ruthlessly destroy the leader of Team Rocket, vastly underleveled. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, eight badges down, feeling spicy. So the next section of the game involves walking up two very long routes to Victory Road and eventually the Elite Four. We get some good experience in, we deal with a rival, and as I get to the Elite Four, I realize, like, we are trash. We don't even have a six Pokemon. We're vastly underleveled. What is our game plan here? Right, like Lorelei's lead is level 54. That's four levels higher than the ace of the champion in this game regularly. So take a little time, I kinda do some analysis of our team and I realize what we need is an electric type. And so I run through the options of electric Pokemon in Johto. You have Lantern, you have Magnemite. Many of you might mention Ampharos, which is not available in Crystal whatsoever. And then my chat reminds me of an electric type that would be very useful for this run. And that Pokemon goes by the name of Raikou, the legendary beast. Now normally I'm not one for using legendaries, but considering what an absurd disadvantage we're at, it feels all right to me. So for anyone that was wondering, the most optimal way to catch the legendary beasts is fly to Ecruteak and then head down through the following three routes. Run a super repel and have a Pokemon that is in the 30s so that the only Pokemon that it can appear are Entei and Raikou. And once you get to the route that's like just above Goldenrod and you've checked that grass, head back to Ecruteak and just, just, that's how you do it. That's how you find these guys. I spent like an hour not doing this and we never found anything. And within like two minutes of trying the strategy, we find Raikou. It's... Let's go! That was such a grind, but that was so satisfying. And so there you have the sixth member of our team. Not even really that good, just something that you didn't have to grind. Anyway, Lorelei is up to start and she leads Dugong. Raikou is able to do some pretty nice damage to take it out and then one shot her cloister. Okay, okay. Maybe we have a shot at this. Jinx isn't too much trouble either, but Lapras is where we start to get into some issues. Its bulk makes it very hard to kill, so I just opt to start nerfing it with Sand Attack and Confuse Ray. We do get it down, but it gets Hyper Potion, so we have to kill it twice, but a combination of Starmie and Umbreon actually do really well here. Slowbro is out last, and it really can't do much to Umbreon, as we claim our first dub. Overall, that was not easy, but not too hard either. Now, Bruno is up next, and in Gen 1, this guy is like the laughing stock of the Elite Four. I've seriously never seen anyone lose to Bruno before, um, so I'm going in feeling confident. One Razor Leaf is enough to kill his first Onyx, and from here he swaps to Hitmonchan. I'm expecting a Fire Punch, so I swap to Starmie, and then Nidoking King to finish it off with two Earthquakes. The champ is out next, and this is basically a brute force fest, let's be honest. Not having access to the move Psychic on Starmie is a massive hindrance. If we had this, it would be fine. Anyway, after some sparks and earthquakes, we are able to take that down too, and Arcanine gets super lucky on high jump kick dodges to take out Hitmonlee. Lastly, Onyx goes down easy, and we beat Bruno. Overall, this fight was a lot harder than expected, just because of that lack of super effective moves. But despite all that, we're able to take the dub and move on to Agatha. Now, Agatha leads with a level 56 Gengar. I lead Umbreon to avoid the Dream Eater Hypnosis combo, but her Nightshade still hurts quite a bit. Really, it's the Gengars we need to worry about for this fight, so I'm prepared to take heavy losses. My first Shadow Ball lands a special defense drop, and after a massive fight, our Quick Claw activates when it matters, and Umbreon takes out Gengar with 21 HP to spare. Now, fortunately for us, Crobat didn't exist in Gen 1, so Golbat is out next. Starmie is able to get a nice speed drop on it with Icy Wind, and then we get a lucky 
the Confused Ray hit on Golbat to stall another turn. I hit Recover, Golbat is confused no more, so Starmie must go down, but not before landing a pretty nice Surf. From here, with the stat drop, Nidoking King outspeeds and takes it down in two more hits. Next up is Haunter, and Nidoking King is able to get a one-hit KO Earthquake on this guy. Gengar is out next, and I swap Arcanine, who is actually able to get a burn on her level 60 Gengar. Gengar is able to get off a of Hypnosis, however, so we swap Raikou and finish it off with a Spark. Arbok is out last and is off by another Earthquake from the King of Nidos. So that's dub number three, and interestingly enough, this fight is our easiest yet, as we just had way more to deal with this team. And that was like my plan going in, right? Don't worry as much about the first members, prepare for the final members. So you know that wager I made about giving away a copy of Scarlet and Violet for every trainer that I lose to? Well, guys, I concede. <laughs> I was in for a very rude awakening into this next fight as Lance whooped me. And it would actually take a few resets on Lance before I realized the strategy I needed. Lance is tricky because, like, everything has hyper beam. So the, the key to beating him is just optimizing when he uses it so that you can actually take advantage of the recharge. Anyway, I'll let you know how to enter the giveaway real soon. Here's how the fight went. So my strategy basically revolved around Raikou for this. I needed to kill his Gyarados with Raikou while not taking any damage from him. We would outspeed to take it into orange, but then he would land Hyper Beam and then we kill. And see, that's that loss of that recharge turn. You're not taking advantage of it. You're not taking advantage of it because you already outspeed and it dies. So this event actually happened on our fourth try as I hit a para on our first spark and he is actually Paralyzed. We're able to take down Gyarados, no damage on Raikou. After this, it's the Dragonairs, where we send out Meganium because it's just super bulky and can take hits. Meganium is actually able to take out the first one, which is just a job well done for a Meganium. You really can't ask for any more than that. <laughs> From here, Starmie comes out to nerf the second one with Icy Wind and Confusion, and Nidoking cleans it up on the Hyper Beam Recharge. This is the other key. My first attempt, I was like, oh yeah, Starmie, special attacker, Icy Wind, gonna do a lot of damage on Dragonite, and it does a quarter. So I realized that's just not on the table. No, see the key to Dragonite is this thing called Sand Attack with Umbreon. Umbreon is bulky enough to take a hit and land a Sand Attack, and then the Sand Attack starts sort of snowballing so you can land more Sand Attacks, and now Dragonite is like minus four accuracy. This goes beautifully. We then swap back to Nidoking King to land some Ice Punches and it goes down. Now, lastly, this is why we needed Raikou. Dragonite is scary, but honestly, Aerodactyl might be scarier. It's so fast, it's so strong, it is just like an easy sweep. So because Aerodactyl doesn't see a kill on Raikou, it isn't gonna go for Hyper Beam and instead just wants to hit Super Sonics, which is amazing because the first one misses and we're able to land Sparks and actually win the fight. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Elite Four down with only one major run-in. Now, if you were wondering, Patrick, how do I claim the copy of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet? Subscribe to the channel, and I want you to comment. Comment your favorite niche, rare Pokemon to use through a Gen 2 playthrough. Also, if you want to play this ROM hack yourself, just follow the link through to my Twitter. It'll be right there. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have made it to the final fight, and it is now time to take on Blue. Sure, Lance may have got the best of us, but I have prepared this team meticulously for this fight, and I know that we are ready. Oh, dude, I gotta say. Feels cool. Feels really cool to fight Blue Gen 2 Elite Four Champion. Right, so Blue leads with a level 61 Pidgeot. Goes for a Sky Attack, but does not kill Raikou. In fact, Raikou is able to take out Pidgeot. Up next is Alakazam, and I just gotta say, are we glad we have Umbreon for this? Like, honestly, Alakazam is probably just an auto-lose condition for us with Oat Umbreon just sweeping us, so this is amazing. Now, since it knows Recover, my strategy is to just run Shadow Ball, try to get that special defense drop. Uh, fortunately, we don't get any special defense drops, so I just have to PP stall with Headbutt until it runs out of Recovers. After that, it's just a simple matter of taking it down with Bite. Now, Rhydon is up next, who has a really bad move pool, and we just swap to Starmie, who is able to dodge the 30% accuracy Horn Drill. From here, we outspeed and land a Surf to one shot. So next up is Gyarados, and this is a bit of a tricky one. We really don't want to lose Starmie, so I actually just opt to swap to Nidoking, take the Hyper Beam, and let it die. From here, we're able to get a free swap to Raikou. Since Gyarados has to recharge, we're able to get a free two-shot in it and take it down. Now, Executor comes up next, and Arcanine is able to get it down to Red with the burn before going down. From here, we've got a very specific play we need to make. We actually swap to Starmie because we want to have it out for Charizard. Starmie is able to take it down without taking any damage, and out comes. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, Blue's level 65 Charizard. 25 levels higher than us. 
How are we gonna do it? So Charizard has five Fire Blasts, and it uses its first one on Sturm. We're able to get an Icy Wind off to lower its speed. Now it's speeding, we're able to get off a Surf, and its Fire Blast actually missed. I'm thinking we got this in the bag, but the next Surf is just not quite enough to take it out, to put it down way into the red, and Fire Blast takes it out. That's number three, if you're counting. From here we swap Raikou, and Blue, of course, heals. Two Sparks is able to take it down into the orange before the fourth Fire Blast takes out Raikou. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got an Umbreon and a Meganium. And can you guess what we're gonna do here? So we actually swap Umbreon here to go for a bite and then take the final Fire Blast. Since Umbreon is so tanky, it doesn't actually kill, but Charizard's able to take us out on the next hit. And now, with a Charizard that has no more Fire Blasts left, we're able to swap into Meganium. All it can do is go for a pitifully weak Fire Spin to take us not even into orange, and a single Body Slam is enough to finish the fight. And ladies and gentlemen, that is Pokemon Crystal with Gen 1 leaders. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.